so welcome everyone to the support seminar. For those of you who've joined the earlier seminars, and I see there's a number of people who have joined previous ones, um, but the, there are a few new names that I see on the list. Welcome to the APPOR 2020 seminars. We normally would be holding APPOR in person um, as a two-week training course, as well as a number of public seminars. This year, we've been holding the public seminars via Zoom um, and have had um, a mix of local and international speakers um, in our seminars. Today's seminar is slightly longer than the earlier seminars. Um, um, Gabriel's asked for extra time in order to, to give his um, full message. So we, we've extended it um, by a bit longer than normal. We'd normally have a session of an hour and a quarter to an hour and a half, and we are extending it by half an hour to two hours. So um, I hope you'll be able to bear with us. We have three exciting speakers and very relevant speakers. We've got um, Gabriel Palmer and Nikki will introduce him. We've got Neva Machetla from TIPS, and we've got Basani Beloy um, from Oxfam. Um, and we're looking forward to some interesting and robust debates. We encourage people to use the chat as well as the Q&A. So if you see on your screen, um, there's a chat function where you can engage with other participants. And then there's the Q&A if you want to ask questions. We will also have time um, later on in the discussion to allow people to um, um, ask questions. So there's a hand raise function. Um, so after we've had all three presentations, we can then um, ask people to raise their hands um, and then we can unmute you in order to um, share your inputs and your, your questions as well. Um, so we um, should have um, quite a nice discussion today. The topic is um, um, economic or income inequality and we have um, quite important issues to discuss here, particularly in the context of COVID-19 and in South Africa with, with all of our specific challenges around inequality and how we understand and how we engage on these things is absolutely critical. Um, we have quite a um, robust audience. I think we look slightly at 98 people and I'm sure there'll be a few more people joining. And it's a mix of researchers, academics, government people, policy makers and civil society, and I think there might be one or two journalists as well. Um, so thanks everyone for joining today and we're looking forward um, to the inputs. Let me hand over to Nikki Catania, who's co-chairing with me. And we also have Baba Nopule, who's also one of our chairs, who's helping with the technical <laughs> side in the background today. Okay, let me then hand over to Nikki to do the introductions um, of our speakers. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Saul. Can you hear me? It's also a little bit wonky here. Um, I'm very, very pleased to uh, welcome back uh, Gabrielle Palmer to Apport. It has been a year or two since you've been able to this review. So uh, we're very pleased about that. Uh, Gabrielle is a senior lecturer at the Faculty of Economics at Cambridge University where he has taught econometrics, macroeconomics, development, and economic history since 1981. He's also co-editor of the Cambridge Journal of Economics and a member of four task forces in Joseph Stiglitz's Initiative for Policy Dialogue at Columbia. His research interests predominantly focus on three areas, the economic history of Latin America, the political economy of recent economic reforms in Latin America and Asia, and why inequality is so unequal across the world, including papers on income distribution, deindustrialization, the global financial crisis, and other financial crises, capital controls, trade and industrial policy, economic reform in various countries. He's also published on the history of ideas in development economics and politics, especially on radical critiques of the current orthodoxy. He's co-editor of books on Nicholas Caldor and Richard Kahn's contribution to political economy, and also co-editor of a book on the East Asian financial crisis. He's currently writing a book on income inequality, on the Palmer ratio, 
and on an economic history of Latin America, as well as a book collecting his papers on the political economy of neoliberal reforms in Latin America and East Asia. Welcome, Gabriel. Uh, Neva Machetla is a senior economist, trade and industrial policy at TIPS, that's Trade and Industrial Policy Strategies, where she has been since 2015. She was Deputy Director General for Economic Policy in South Africa's Economic Development Department from 2010 to 2014. Before, before joining EDD, she worked for the Presidency, the Development Bank of Southern Africa, and COSATU, as well as other government departments. Before 1994, she worked in various universities in Africa and the US. Dr. Mahertla's research centers on aspects of industrial policy and value chain analysis and on socioeconomic challenges facing South Africa, especially around employment creation, inequality, and most recently, the economic impact of COVID-19 on the economy. And then Basani Baloy is a feminist development economist and activist. She's Oxfam South Africa's inequality lead in the Economic Justice Unit. Basani has over 10 years of research experience, gained working in academia at the Center for Creation and Economic Development, as well as the Corporate Strategy and Industrial Development Unit, focused on issues of industrial policy. Basani is also the former director of industrial policy and acting chief director in the industrial procurement unit at the Department of Trade, Industry and Competition. Her functional expertise is in policy analysis and research management, movement building, public campaigning and advocacy. Her thematical expertise is in inequality, work and wages. She's also a board member of the Southern Center for Inequality Studies. She holds a PhD in economics from SOAS, an MA in public policy, and an MCOM in economics from Wits University. Thanks, Saul. Thanks, Nikki. Um, let's go straight away to Gabriel with your presentation. Um, you want to put up your slides? Um, you can start. Thank you very much for the invitation. <clears throat> it's, a, it's a pleasure to, to be here, although probably it will be nicer to be in Johannesburg doing it, but. Um, that's what it is at the moment. What I want to talk today is mostly about the diversity of inequality in the world. One of the crucial subjects in economics is why there is this diversity of inequality in the world. And it's a subject that has been debated. I mean, half of the Amazon has been deforest in the debate about this. And um, I'm going to go on the numbers and a bit on the theory, and um, hopefully in this one hour I got from now onwards, uh, I'll be able to 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 present uh, the whole subject, which is not only the inequality in terms of disposable income, meaning after taxes and transfers, which is what normally is, is discussed, but also inequality in the market, the one that uh, arises from productive processes, productive activities. I'm going to share my screen, and uh, what I'm going to discuss is a series of stylized facts in terms of inequality. There will be about five or six in disposable income inequality and another five or six in market inequality. And um, that will help us to, to put a bit of order in this whole set of subjects. The first one, which is hardly a surprise, and everybody obviously is completely aware, is that inequality is, highly, is, is uh, basically very highly unequal across countries, okay? meaning that uh, there is a huge diversity of inequality as far as inequality of in disposable income, meaning after taxes and transfers. If we start with the old-fashioned Gini, um, an index that the advantage it has is that it tries to give a number for the overall inequality of a country. We'll see later on that, that it's an advantage and a big disadvantage because within this 
overall inequality in a country, there are two totally different processes going on. And therefore, uh, to inevitably, the Gini will end up to be uh, mixing both things. And therefore, it will be an average of apples and pears, and that is a problem. And we'll try to solve that problem. Now, the first figure is basically what is the Gini coefficient in the group of 130 countries that the World Bank give us a reasonable equality data. And what we have here, uh, starting, as I said, with the Gini, and how anybody will be surprised, is that the Gini goes from 25 to nearly 65. For those of you who may not be familiar with the Gini, it's a very simple estimator in the sense that if it's zero, it's perfect equality, everybody ends exactly the same. And if it is one, um, one or a hundred, according to how you work with it, uh, it means that one person gets all the income and nobody else gets any income at all. So the higher the number, the higher the degree of inequality. So we have countries with really low inequality uh, at around 25, some Eastern European countries, the Nordic countries, some uh, continental Euro European countries. And on the other extreme, of course, as everybody knows, is basically Latin America and Southern Africa. By Southern Africa, I mean the mineral rich middle income countries of Southern Africa, where you are not only South Africa, but Botswana and Namibia, and now follow rather closely by uh, other uh, neighboring countries there, Angola, Zaire, and so on. So the diversity is as, as high as it can be. I mean, it's difficult to imagine a world with a higher diversity than this, and um, probably has never been so diverse. Now, as I said, this issue has been at the core of economic analysis ever since Ricardo, who was the one who brought inequality into the center of economic analysis. In fact, as you know, he defined economics as a sign who study the distribution of income among the classes that are involved in the process of production, capitalists, rentists, and workers. So, but to simplify things, there are basically two approaches which are completely different. One is the neoclassical one, but it's not just the neoclassical one, who basically try to think or try to find some exogenous variables that could explain this inequality. The level of income per capita, whether you have national resources, democracy versus dictatorship, big and small, a geographical location, you name it. Uh, human capital, of course, is another one. You name it, meaning somehow inequality is an endogenous variable, which is determined by a set of exogenous variables, uh, from the weather to whatever you want. As you know, it's a huge literature of uh, papers that runs ever more sophisticated regression in which the dependent variable is inequality measured in terms of the Gini, and they try to find an ever more uh, imaginative and sophisticated so-called exogenous variable that somehow will determine the sort of 19th century uh, uh, physics, the, uh, the sort of uh, the uh, unique direction of causality, cause effect, and the unique direction of causality. From this set of exogenous variables, we end up with the genie we have. And somehow, I mean, you know, Kutznes was uh, one that uh, started a lot, uh, not started, but developed a lot this analysis with the famous inverted U. Somehow, middle income countries like South Africa or my, my own country, Chile, somehow because being middle income they are bound to be unequal i mean uh, poor little things i mean they're bound to be unequal and there is very little you can do and even further if you try to do something about it it may well be counterproductive so just let things go as they are 
because somehow magically, as income per capita increases, inequality will automatically and dangerously fall, and you will get to the levels of inequality of more advanced countries. The other school of thought, for which of course where I come from, is that inequality is a choice. The famous phrase that Stiglitz wrote a few years ago in his book about it. And second, I very much think like John Paul Sartre, thinking that there is nothing that shows better who you are <clears throat> as individual or society than the choices you take. Meaning inequality is not just a choice, but it's a choice that make transparent who you or as individual or society you are. In that sense that uh, if somebody asks me, ah, this, this country in the world, I know nothing. I, um, what, what should I read to, to, look, to learn something? I will immediately ask, look at its degree of inequality. It tells you a lot. What are we talking about? As you know, Schumpeter a century ago said the same, but about taxation. He said, if you, know, you want to know what a country is, look at the fiscal account. Okay, how much the taxes are and whether they're progressive and regressive, what do they do with the public expenditure and so on. I think that uh, following the same type of thinking, I think inequality is really what makes transparent who you are as individual and as a society. Now, having the same graph, but now ordering countries not by their degree of inequality, but by their income per capita, GDP per capita, and it is in logs, but those of you who are not familiar with logs, doesn't make any difference other than the way you order data, but it's a monotonic transformation, so therefore it's the same order, but the range changes. So it's not a, it doesn't distort any, anything. It's just more convenient for this series of reasons. And if you look here at inequality, when you order it according to the income per capita, what you find is basically three things. One is among poor countries, Sub-Saharan Africa, one, two, and three, and four, I call it less than $1,000 per capita, 1,000 to 2,000, 2,000, 3,000, and over 3,000, okay? And you can see that there seems to be a clear upward trend, meaning as income per capita increase among low-income countries, there seems to be a trend for inequality to increase. And that goes all the way to India and China today. The second, which is the one, well, coming from Latin America, the one that it's, I've been trying to think for, well, all my life, is about why, not only why some middle-income countries are so unequal, like South Africa, Chile, Brazil. But more importantly than that, perhaps, is, or as well as that, why there is this amazing range of inequality among middle-income countries, from the, by far, the most unequal in the world to some of the more equal in the world, all in that range of middle-income countries. Of course, that immediately raises doubts about the inequality being a kind of a passive a endogenous variable that somehow middle-income countries are bound to be unequal for X, Y, or Z. Because, well, if that is the case, how can we have this fantastic diversity of inequality? It really very much looks like it is a choice, and a choice that reflects uh, who you are. And the third stylized fact, which is something new, if we had done this, say, in the 80s, all developed countries, high-income countries, will be concentrated at the lower end of inequality. They will have a relatively low level of inequality. However, today, you also have quite a big range of inequality among, um, among uh, high-income countries. And what happens there is that with the neoliberal globalization and financialization and all the rest, you find two types of advanced countries, which we'll look in detail later. 
one, those who have tried quite desperately to hang on to the good level of disposable income inequality they had in the past. We're talking about the Nordic, uh, uh, the continental Europe, Japan, and so on. And we have those who have basically let things go and uh, inequality has moved on in, in the sense that it has increased massively with, uh, with all the things that have been happening since Reagan and Thatcher were elected in the late in 79 and 80. So today you also have a huge, quite a large diversity of inequality among rich countries. But the crucial point analytically for, uh, for people interested in the emerging countries is this amazing diversity of inequality among middle income countries. And a lot of what we're going to say later are, is related to that. The next stylized fact is very strange because we know that there is this huge diversity of inequality across the world. But suddenly, if we only divide the population of each country in two half, each country in the world of these 170 countries of my sample, I separated into half. The middle and upper middle, the size five to nine, and the top and the bottom together, the other half of the population made by the top 10% and the bottom 40%. If I do that, the diversity of inequality disappears. There is no more diversity of inequality in the world. All countries, except but very few at the, at the really high inequality end of the, on the samples, all countries in the world have a, almost a very similar share, these two half have a very similar shares across countries. And not only that, each half of this population is very close to having half, in some do, but normally it's very close to have half of the national income uh, each, meaning the national pie is divided in two half. One goes to one half of the population and the other goes to the other half of the population. No, if within these two half, they will distribute each half of the pie also relatively evenly, then there will be no diversity of inequality in the world. So it follows that given the fact that there is such an amazing homogeneity in what these two half of the population acquire in terms of, nation, of the pie of the national income, each one half, it follows that it has to be, we have to look within these two half because the two half must distribute in a rather different way, that half within the half of other population. And this is what brings us to a stylized fact, which I think is, at least from the point of view of my work, the absolutely crucial one, is that if you look at the middle and upper middle, they not only get half of the national income across the world, but they also distribute that half within themselves in a very homogeneous way. Meaning the upper middle, the size seven to nine, they get roughly 70% of that half. And the middle middle, the, the size five to nine, gets roughly the other 30. Meaning if the other half of the population, top and bottom, were to do the same, meaning of the half of the income they get, some share will go evenly across countries in the world and the bottom 40 the same, then there will be no diversity of inequality in the world. But we know there is. And what we can see here is something which is the core of my work, which is the diversity of, the, of inequality in the world is only about how half of the national income is distributed among half of the population of each country. Because the other half of the national income that goes to the middle and upper middle, let's call it the administrative classes following in the institutional economics, they distribute their half very evenly across the world. So 
all the diversity of inequality in the world is an, almost entirely about how only half of the world population in each country, the top and bottom, the top 10 and the bottom fourth, they distribute the half of the national income that they get together, how they distribute that half among themselves. You can see there are countries here, the same Eastern Europe and some Eastern Europe, not very many, a few left, and the Nordic countries, a couple in continental Europe, that the share of the bottom 40% is larger than the share of the top 10. One is 40%, the other 10. So individually, it's the other way around. But as a group, the top 40%, the bottom 40%, sorry, the bottom, the poorest 40%, get as a whole, as a group, more than the top 10. And we have countries at the, no price for guessing who they are, in which of the half that goes to this half of the population, half of income going to this half of the population, the top 10 gets up to 90% of that half, leaving just the crumbs for the, for the poor, leaving just about 10% of that half. Meaning the diversity here is absolute. From 40% getting more to 40% getting next to nothing. So this is what we have to understand. If we want to understand inequality, one has to center the analysis on this half of the population. Why is it that in some country, the top 10 is not even able to get more than bottom 40? and other countries in the world where the top 10 gets almost the entire half that goes together for them and the bottom 40. This is the crucial analytical point. This is where one, if one wants to understand diversity of inequality, this is where one should concentrate. Because the administrative classes are highly homogeneous in terms of the way they distribute the in, their income across the world. But the other half, which it will be nice to call them the production classes as opposed to the administrative classes. But in the new technological paradigm, that is a bit simplistic. So uh, I will resist the temptation to call this the production classes. But it's basically the inequality come from here. Okay. So my index, which by the way, I didn't call it Palmer ratio. I suggested the index following that and the literature call it like that. The Palmer ratio is basically an index as opposed to the Gini that tries to measure inequality where inequality exists. Because the problem of the Gini, as I mentioned already before, is that it mixes this distributed dynamic to this other one, which are two totally different distributed dynamics. So every econometry work that has the Gini as a dependent variable, one, have, one can discuss if that makes sense or not, but in terms of econometric, but forgetting that, every econometric variable, uh, regression, who has the Gini as a dependent variable, by definition is making a specification error. No matter how sophisticated, and no matter how intelligent the so-called exogenous variable are, by definition is making a specification error because they're using the same specification to explain homogeneity and heterogeneity, to explain two totally diverse distributed dynamics in one half of the population and in the other. So that by definition in econometric is a specification error because it cannot be that the same variable explain two things which are taught are the opposite. Either they explain one or they explain the other. Or if you use the genie, they explain a mixture of the two, a mixture of the apple with pear. And that is my main problem with the genie. And that's why I suggested my index that basically is the ratio of how much the top 10 gets to how much the bottom 40 gets, which is obviously come from this graph before. Okay, so if it is one, or below one, if it is one, it means that the rate, the share of income that goes to the top 10 is equal to the share of income that goes to the bottom 40. If it is, in the case of South, South, South Africa, seven, 
it means that the top 10 gets seven times more as a share of national income than what the bottom 40 gets, okay? So again, the diversity is, as, I mean, it cannot be higher. But there is another stylized factor come here, which is the following. Look at the first 100, 110 countries in the world. Inequality surely increases, we know that, except that that's pretty much linearly. If the last 20 countries in the sample would have continued the same pace of deterioration that happens in the first 100 countries, the country's most unequal country in the world will have a Palmer ratio of about three. That instead of three is seven. So inequality now we can even pinpoint it even more specific. It's not only what happened between the top and the bottom, but also the real diversity of inequality is only in a few countries in the world, no more than 20 or so, roughly, where inequality measured by the Palmer ratio explodes. Meaning instead of continue growing linearly, it explodes geometrically. Now, how is it? How is it that only in a few countries in the world, also geographically located in Southern Africa and Latin America, the top 10 is able to squeeze the bottom 40 almost out of existence. And is able to do that at a much faster pace than the increase in equality of the first 100, 110 countries in the world. So this is the analytic, the, if one wants to understand diversity and equality, the real analytical challenge is about why just in a few countries in the world, the top 10 can squeeze the bottom 40 almost out of existence. That is the issue. That is the core of the problem in terms of diversity of inequality and comes very clearly from this uh, inequality uh, ratio, uh, inequality index that I suggest. Now, next, following my methodology, look at, we can explain much better diversity of inequality. Look at Finland and Uruguay. Two countries, which of course are rather different, and we know they have a very different inequality, Uruguay being much more unequal than Finland. Gini 40, Gini 27, Palma ratio 1.8, Palma ratio 1. So there is very little <laughs> uh, surprise here. The point is that my methodology helped to understand why is it that Uruguay is more unequal than Finland? Because if you look, the middle and upper middle gets the same income in both countries, share of income. So all the diversity is about the top 10 in Uruguay being able to appropriate what the top 10 does in Finland plus an extra bit of income, which is 7%, which I call D10 plus. D10 because it's the top 10 and plus because it's the extra amount of income. And in that extra amount of income is entirely taken from the bottom 40. Entirely taken because instead of the bottom 40 in Uruguay having 23 as in Finland, they have 16. And why do they have 16? Because the top 10 appropriated 7% of national income more than in Finland. Now, this, the 10 plus, and we don't have time to discuss now, but we can discuss later, for me is a distributional failure. I don't see a single ob so-called objective reason that can explain why Uruguay, in Uruguay the top 10 gets this 7% extra in terms of national income. Is more tolerance to inequality in Uruguay, is about the nature of the elite, is about that all proper, uh, endogenous issues to the political settlement that you find uh, in Uruguay. is that interaction between political settlements and market failure, in this case, creating distributional failure. So this is the point, is why in some countries in the world, some, the top 10 can squeeze the bottom in a way that in other countries in the world they can't. And as I said, there is no exogenous reason, okay? As Jean-Paul Sartre always insisted, 
you cannot blame exogenous reason for any of these uh, social phenomena. Okay, they are all endogenously created. Now, but we still have to understand the last 20 countries. Why is it in the last 20 countries, the top 10 not only can squeeze the bottom 40 a little bit more, but it, it can squeeze it almost out of existence. But even then, that is not enough to understand the inequality in those countries. And here is the answer, Estalai fact number five. In a few countries in the world, here we have two, Brazil and South Africa, the top 10, and only in these 20 countries, that's the point. In, that is my answer to the question I raised before. Only in these 20 countries, the top 10 not only can squeeze the bottom 40, as I said, almost out of existence, they can take this D10 plus out of the bottom 40, but are the only countries in the world in which the administrative classes, D5, D9, cannot get their half. So the top 10 can squeeze the middle and upper middle below 50 and can squeeze the bottom 40 almost out of existence. Therefore, we have two sectors in this pie. The D10 plus that we already know, how much the top gets from the bottom, distributional failure one, but also how much the top can squeeze the middle below 50. And I call this D10 plus plus, and this is my distributional failure too. Because again, there is no reason objective, external, given, exogenous, okay? Reason to understand why in these 20 countries, the top can also squeeze the middle. Something that in the, the other 110 countries in the world, the top cannot do. I'm sure they would love to do it, but they can't. Politically, they don't have the cloud, the power, the lobby, the, the capacity to capture institution, the capacity to uh, distort market uh, in their favor, the capacity that they have in these 20 countries, so that they can not only squeeze the poor in much more than anybody else, of course, 14 in Brazil, 18 in, in South Africa, but also they can squeeze the middle below that uh, 50%, okay? So this is the answer of the question. This is basically what's going on. That the diversity of inequality in terms of disposable income in the world is about two factors. One, the general one, which is D10 plus. How much the top 10 can squeeze the bottom 40 below a Palmer ratio of one, which according to Stiglitz and other, uh, and other people who has worked, uh, use my methodology, they argue that would be the sort of optimal uh, distribution inequality. Uh, that the bottom, that they, the both half get at about 50 and that the, in the half of top and bottom, they get equal share. So they get a Palmer ratio of one like in Finland. So the diversity of inequality in the world is about two things. One, the 10 plus, how much the top can squeeze the bottom over and above having an equal share in that half and how much the top can in a few countries can squeeze the middle below 50, okay? And if you look at that, the whole diversity of inequality not only makes sense, but becomes, becomes something that uh, you can, I think, uh, really disaggregate what matters from other kind of issues. Now, moving on quickly because of time that flies, uh, although we started 15 minutes late, but uh, let's keep moving on because of time. Let's look now at market inequality. Now, market inequality, as I already mentioned, is about inequality before taxes and transfers. It's about inequality, the inequality that is generated in the market, as the name says. The inequality that comes out of production processes. Imagine if there were no taxes and transference, that would be the inequality that each country has. So somehow there is a quote unquote uh, national inequality that emerges from the type of 
markets and production processes and elite and the working class and the, the one that comes in the market in the in the production process and the inequality that is emerged afterwards when the state gets into that via first taxing and then this uh, transfers making transfer to to the poor and so on so let's look at market inequality now and to look at market inequality let's compare germany with chile let's go back to disposable income first and the first point is obvious if you look at germany and chile are two countries with completely different income distribution germany being much far more, high, uh, more equal than chile or chile being far more unequal than germany if you compare it quickly you, the difference is because the top third, the top 10 in chile like in brazil and south africa can squeeze the middle below 50 the 10 plus plus and because it can squeeze the bottom 40 more than uh, sharing by half the half that goes to them of the of the income so we have d10 plus which is how much this 38 come from squeezing the 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 bottom 40 if chile were to have the same inequality disposable income inequality than germany obviously the difference here is eight points the top bottom 40 gets eight percent of point menos less than 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 uh, germany and of course the middle gets much less than germany so again nobody's surprised about this but surely this is pretty surprising and this is stylized fact number six if you look at market inequality between G german and chile look what has been going on since the neoliberal revolution globalization cum financialization or whatever you want to call it germany in the late 70s had a market inequality that was miles ahead of chile a market inequality and unfortunately here we have to go back to the genie because you wouldn't believe but none of the data source that gives data on market inequality none neither the world bank no salt no nobody gives data on deciles they only report the genie therefore we cannot work with the palmar ratio methodology and we have to go back to the old genie no matter what problems it may have so let's go back to the genie for the time being now if you look at the genie germany in the late 70s had a genie that was what a, about 15 percentage point better than chile so it was as everybody will expect that for whatever reason germany had a much better not only disposable income inequality than chile but much better market inequality but look what has happened with ever since and this is german reunification which of course shows that the process of increasing market inequality was well underway much before reunification it just continued after reunification and in case of chile a is the return to democracy after pinochet and you can see despite five five center-left government how little if it has been done in terms of market inequality we're going to get that in a minute so what do we have here is that today germany is in fact more unequal than chile more unequal than chile in market inequality what happened is that once they create the highly unequal market inequality they make a pharaonic attempt through taxes and transference we will see they spend 25 percent of gdp 25 percent of gdp in order to do this transference okay we'll see the numbers in a minute but basically 40 percent of the public expenditure in germany 40 percent which is equivalent to 16 percent gdp is just social protection and then if you add free education and free health that goes to two-thirds of the budget and to 25 percent of gdp 25 percent okay now but market inequality germany is now slightly more unequal let's forget the slightly yeah. it's as unequal that 
almost every country, only Brazil is a tiny mere bit more unequal than Germany. But given the trend of Germany, give it a few years and it's going to be in Brazil. So what the hell is going on? I mean, how is it that an economy that it used to have one of the most decent income distribution coming out of the production processes now has a Latin American style. And this is a really important because this is what I call that reverse catching up. So instead of remember the Washington consensus and all this uh, soap opera that we've been, the, we, well, those of you who are my age remember and those of you who are much younger have, must have read about it. I mean, the whole story of the Washington, original Washington consensus was that if you do what we tell you, liberalize everything and uh, transform the state in some sort of immaculate organism and just let things go, let basically beach agents capable to distort market in the way they like, okay? That is the bottom line. Now, if you did that, following neoclassical economics, the solo so on model and so on, what we will have, we would, they, what they promise, was that there will be a, a very rapid process of catching up. Meaning, given the assumptions of neoclassical economics in the gross model, if you did what they promise, then the lower the level of income per country, the faster will be the rate of growth of GDP per capita. So basically the gap of GDP per capita it will, will get closer and closer up to basically there will be process of catching up, okay? Oddly enough, what has happened is not that it didn't happen what they said. What happened was exactly the opposite. The, it was Germany who caught up with Chile, not Chile who caught up with Germany in terms of inequality. It's labor market in Germany that got Latin Americanized and Europe and let alone the US, as you know. It's not, it's labor market in Europe who got Latin Americanized. It's not that the Latin American labor market became Europe, Europe, size or whatever how you say that. Okay, there was a reverse caption. And this is very interesting because if you remember Marx, uh, for the younger generation, he was a beer guy who lived in the 19th century, who wrote some interesting things. Anyway, according to Marx, the famous quote in the beginning of his crucial books, it was that the advanced countries show the more backward countries the image of their own future. So Marx was also thinking of a catching up in the traditional sense for different reasons than the neoliberal Washington consensus, but they both were basically saying the same thing for different reasons. For Marx also, in capitalism, there would be a catching up. And as, I, and as he said, the advanced countries show the more back, backward one, the, the lower income one, the image of their own future. Now, maybe it was so then. Today is the other way around. It is the highly unequal middle income country, in this case, Latin American country, who shows the advanced countries, Europe, European countries, the image of their own future. It is Latin America who is telling Europe, US and so on, how are they going to look in the future and how they're already, in terms of market inequality, how they already look, rather than the other way around, okay? What we have had, is a process of bananization of the di market distribution of high income countries. It's a process of Latin Americanization of their income inequality in the market and not the other way around as almost logic, sort of instinctive logic will tell you uh, that the, the advanced countries will try to keep their degree of civilization in the terms of their labor market, institutions, and so on. And developing countries will try to, uh, a bit of evolution, they will try to get catch up. Well, this neoliberal globalization, financialization, and all the rest of things you know, what has produced is exactly the opposite. It's this reverse catching up, okay? Now, but 
here there are two questions. How is it that Germany, having such an equal market inequality, gets to such good disposable income inequality? And the second, did Germany have a choice? Because a lot of people, certainly neoliberals and neoclassical economists, and a lot of German, even at certain left, tells me, well, was there a choice, okay? Remember the famous phrase of Margaret Thatcher, there is no alternative, okay? Well, was there an alternative? So that's the two questions. How does Germany go from being so Latin American and equal in market to being one of the most equal countries in the world disposable? And the answer is more or less obvious. Pharaonic attempt, taxes and transfer. And the second is, was there an alternative? And no prices for guessing, yes, there was, and we'll see it in a second. So basically here, a very crucial quote from Keynes, because when Keynes was working in the, uh, his, one of his foremost book in 1919, The Economic Consequences of Peace in Europe, he was analyzing Germany and the US, then the emerging countries. Particularly, he was working on the late 19th century when Germany and, and the US were catching up with, the, with Britain. And what he said was something which is, I think, goes to the core of, of the problem. Because they were catching up because the new rich of the 19th century, the, rich in Germ the new rich in Germany and the US, they prefer the power which investment gave them to the pleasure of immediate consumption. Here lays, in fact, the main justification of the capitalist system. If the rich had spent their wealth on their own enjoyment, as opposed to investment, the world would have long found the system intolerable. So the crucial issue he was identify why was it that the new, those emerging countries were catching up. For him was is that the newly rich of these countries in the process of growth and development, what basically what they were doing is they were devoting a, a larger and larger share of what they got out of the pie, income pie of, the, of those economies into productive uses as opposed to consumption, okay? And that is basically what makes capitalism for him legitimate? Because if that were not happening, as it's not happening in Europe, in the US, in, in South Africa, or in Latin America, is the opposite. The, we'll see in a second, the higher the share of income that goes to the top, the lower the proportion of that income that comes back into the economy in terms of productive uses, meaning investment. It's exactly the other way, the other way around. So, from that Keynes perspective, which always is only part of it, it shouldn't be a surprise that instead of catching up in the, in the right sense, how Germany and the US were catching up in the 19th century, uh, a process, as I said, that Marx was witness and predicting, is was that now we have the opposite, is European countries and Japan and the US, certainly the US, uh, catching up with, uh, uh, is the US with Latin Americanizing, has Latin Americanized as opposed to the Latin American that has transformed themselves into like Europe or the US. Now, Estalai 5, which I have already mentioned, is that look at Germany. The higher the in level of inequality in the market, which Obviously, although we don't have data for deciles, it's, uh, it's not a big surprise that the, the higher the share of income that goes to the top in the market, the lower the level of in, in, in investment as a share of GDP in the economy. It started by 30 when Germany had one of the best market distribution in the world, and today it's just only 20 when Germany has a Latin American uh, market inequality. And surprise, surprise, this 20 is exactly like the Latin American level of investment. It meaning, I mean, in Latin America, it happens what it, it's quite interesting because if you look at in the advanced countries, it has helped certainly me to understand the Latin elite can get away with what they do.
percent of GDP. Well, now we see that the elites in the advanced countries are doing exactly the same. Not only the higher the inequality, the lower the rate of investment in GDP, meaning the more money goes to the top, the lower the proportion of that extra money that goes back to the economy in terms of productive investment. And it gets to the Latin American, I mean, this Latin Americanization of the advanced countries is, is not just in inequality. It's also on the, on the things that you will find in highly unequal market inequality country, which is very low level of investment. And uh, very quickly, because time is really running, we can that the chief economist of the Bank of England, which is not particularly an hetero economist, what he's talking today is about this process of self-cannibalism. Basically that in order to get the high level of inequality in market in Europe and the US and so on, what big business is doing, they are basically eating up their own resources, they're eating up their own assets. Because obviously they, the only way that you can get to inequalities of the level that they do is about this process of self-cannibalism. And basically the other thing of course is that uh, there has been this unbelievable process of merging and, uh, and acquisitions, $40 trillion only in the last decade, which has to do with that, but let's go on because of time. And then if the rate of investment in GDP is falling in the way it's falling, uh, so price of freight, the rate of productivity grows, the rate of growth of productivity has also collapsed in Germany. It used to be, with, is in the, right access, okay, the productivity grows. So as inequality go to the level of uh, low 50s, 50s, like, uh, remember Western Chile, not, not far from Brazil. Productivity growth, which was in the four or five range, today is literally not significantly different from zero, as a statistician will say. And so price of price is exactly the same of the Latin American. This is, a, this is the level of inequality of Latin America. The average rate of productivity growth in Latin America since 80 until today is 0.2%. Well, Germany is there. So it seems that the higher the market inequality, countries tend to be an elites, that the same one that managed to capture policy and and emasculate the state and manage to distort market in their own favor so as to get to this ridiculously low level of market inequality. In, that, in the process of doing so, it what collapses its investment, its productivity grows and all the rest, okay? So we know that unfettered market forces are not only unfair, but certainly we know that they are inefficient. We knew that from the study of Latin America, but and other regions, unequal regions in the world, but now it's certainly true in, in, in the advanced countries. Okay, and of course the implication of that are fantastic. According to one columnist of the Financial Times, Germany once saw China as the export market for machinery, which China will develop its industrial base. Today, China is becoming the senior part of the relationship. Would anybody be surprised with that, with those non-existent rate of productivity growth? And of course, this is a symptom of fundamental European problem. And now there are signs that the complacency is turning into panic. Okay, so the implicate the productive implication of that inequality leading to such low level of investment and productivity growth and so on is of course hurting these economies massively and basically leaving them behind. And uh, not, not surprisingly, they're having this reverse catching up. Very quickly because of time, if you look at the US, one of the most transparent countries, if you look at the relationship between how much is private investment and how much is the share of the top 10%, share of income of the top 10%, what we have at the time of Reagan is that roughly the private investment was about half of the share of that was appropriated by the top 10%, meaning the top 10% roughly spent half, at least half of what they got into productive investment. Today is hardly above 20, 20, 25%. And surprise, surprise is the level of Brazil and not much better than the level of South Africa. Okay, this process of Latin Americanization is just, it cannot be more, uh, more obvious. 
just a couple of numbers, because of sometimes it helps a lot, is that if the US has the same level of national income as today, the same GDP, but this, the level of inequality when Reagan was elected, meaning the same pie, but the inequality when Reagan was elected, which was not that great for them huh, to start with, the top 1% today will earn $2 trillion less than what do they do. And the top one is very few people. The US may be large, but the top 1% are not very few people. Those very few people today earn $2 trillion more than what they will earn if the pie was the same, but the inequality was the one that when Reagan was elected. And also, if the US was, had the same GDP and the same inequality, but the share of in investment GDP when Reagan was elected, one trillion dollar, one trillion dollar more would be invested year after year in this period. Meaning, if the US had the same pie and even the same inequality, but the share of investment GDP, which was not that great to start with, if the share of investment GDP that had the, the US had at the time of the election of Reagan, today in the US investment would be one trillion higher per year. And the US economy will be something different than the disaster that it is today, okay? So the, because time is running, we, uh, we get to the last point, which is the follow. Did Germany have an alternative? Did Europe have an alternative? Did the, the US, I mean, was there an alternative in this globalized world, neoliberal globalized world, to, let, to have let inequality in the market explode on their own right, on, on its own pace? On, was there a choice, okay? Now, let's look, compare Germany with Korea. Germany, let's go back to the disposable income and the Palmer ratio and the gene. In both, Germany and Korea has exactly the same Palmer ratio, one, two, one, two, and the same gene, 32, 32. Meaning, Germany and Korea cannot have more equal disposable, in, they have identical disposable income inequality with D10 plus only 2% two, two and 2%. But look, but how do they get there? Although the final destination is the same, a Palma ratio of 1.2 and a Gini of 32, or Gini of about 30, okay? Although they get to the final destination, how did do these two countries get there? As we see, as, as we know from already show, inequality in Germany has exploded. But look at inequal market inequality in Korea. Korea did something rather different, isn't it? I mean, Korea got to the 30, which was the final destination, almost in the market. They hardly had to do any redistribution via taxes and transfer. They hardly had to do any social protection. They hardly had to expend any money in order to improve their market inequality. While Germany, who had to improve the market inequality by 28%, in order to get to a genie roughly of 30, today has to do that 44%. So the question here are obvious. One, how much this gap can continue to grow? How much can it continue to grow and grow and grow? How much more Germany can still stick to its low level of disposable income inequality, given the fact that this market inequality is getting more and more unequal? Today, they spend 25% of GDP in social protection, including health and education, 25%. One of every four euros generated in, in Germany is being used for social protection. Now, surprise, surprise, public investment in Korea is twice as large than in Germany, of course, because they can use their public revenue for other things other than social protection because they already get to a low level of inequality in the market, meaning this is the first best. The only sustain, this is my main point in terms of market inequality. The only way that you can sustain low level of disposable income inequality in the long term is that if that is anchored on a low inequality in the market, 
if you anchor low level of disposable inequality in the market, meaning you already get nearly there in the market and you leave very little for transfer taxes, the role of taxes for transference, as opposed to for the other public goods that include in, in public investment that you make to do, the more close the two, the more sustainable will be that disposable income inequality. And what we have in Europe is something which is completely, had gone, had run completely out of control. Meaning, and there time, I only got about five more minutes, so very quickly. There are here really important points. Uh, first, this is highly inefficient. What is the point to make market inequality explode only to be reversed after taxes on transfer? Uh, it's like that nursery rhyme, uh, the great grand, the grand old Duke of York that it brought its 10,000 men to the top of the hill just to bring them down. I mean, what imagine the transaction cost or letting things go one way just to reverse them the other way. I mean, obviously the transaction costs there and other costs are huge, but also in this new postmodern world, the rich and the large corporations don't pay their taxes. I mean, you only pay taxes, you have a bad account. I mean, there are so many ways that legally, you, as you know, in Europe, Vodafone, Apple, Amazon, Google, don't pay any taxes, Starbucks and so on because legally they can uh, do all the uh, magical realist accounting things to transfer all profits to fiscal paradise. And supposedly they, in their balance sheet, they, don't, they show no, no, no profits. And because they have no profits, of course they pay no taxes. So uh, as those who benefit from that market, increased market inequality, don't even contribute to social protection, to the transfers to they don't pay the taxes so that they can finance the taxes basically europe and the other countries what they do is that they have to overtax the middle in order who those who were not invited to the party they were not invited to the party of the increased market inequality so those who are not invited to the party has to pay the bill and those who were in the party they don't pay the bill so so it's another another not only unfair but also highly inefficient situation so as i said what's the point to let things go one way just to uh, reverse the other but also those who enjoy the higher inequality they don't even contribute to the uh, taxes and transfer which are so korea is obviously the first best and this is a very distant second best of course it's better than latin america i mean uh, is 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 much better is much better than Latin America in the sense that if you look at Sweden and Mexico, of course Sweden like Germany does in massive pro have a, in a market inequality like uh, Latin America in the 50s like Chile and Germany. So market inequality in Sweden is as in a, unequal in Latin America, but they get the GDP even before the disposable income GDP even below to 30. So they do they do a nearly 50 percent effort to trans to to improve there, which is the most inefficient way of getting a good, a lower a level of income inequality. And here, what we have in Mexico is that they also have the Latin American state market inequality, but, but they do very little distributed effort. So obviously it's better the, and this, the, what I call the European social democratic model, meaning abandon your economic agenda and let abandon the post-war and the sort of Keynesian interest in economic agenda and acquire completely the neoliberal agenda and your economic agenda, but try to stick to the social agenda of the post-war and trying to stick to the low level of disposable income inequality. So this is the characteristic of European social democracy. Abandon your economic agenda and stick to your social agenda, which is something highly inefficient, but at least it's better than the Latin American solution that you have this high level of inequality but you do very little to improve it. So you got the worst of both worlds. At least here you got the worst of one world and the best of the other world, okay? And of, but that's not the only way to do it. I mean, compare Taiwan with Brazil. Obviously Taiwan, like Korea, 
it gets to the 30 nil in the market. So the, this, the, the social protection, the redistributed effort is minimal. This is a Taiwan, Korea, and so on, are a sustainable force of low level of inequality. Sweden is already becoming unsustainable, you know, because obviously they cannot overtax the middle so much so as to pay for the social protection. So basically what they do is they have to get into debt. And today, the, before the pandemic, social uh, public sector debt in the social democratic Europe was already on the close to 100% of GDP. So this is basically the two alternatives. Do we get into the countries that get into high level of inequality, those who make the effort and those who don't even bother to make the effort, which of course this is better. However, the real first best, the real optimal solution of having a low level of disposable income inequality, which is sustainable in the, in the long run, meaning to have the, the Keynesian economic agenda, as well as the, social, the progressive social agenda, and both highly interlinked as Europe did after the war, have an economic agenda that already produces a low level of inequality in the market and a social agenda to improve whatever you need to do in the margin, or what you do is in the case of uh, the European social democracy, abandon completely your market, your progressive Keynesian economic agenda, but stick to the social agenda. However, this is better than Latin America, but certainly okay. not the first best. Okay, um, thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Gabriel. That um, I think is um, sheds a lot of light on what's going on in the global situation and gives us um, some very good tools in which to analyze it better and also to think through some of the policy implications for our own situation. I'm now going to ask um, Basani Beloy to um, come on and share her slides. I'm hoping she's not impacted by load shedding and is able to do so. Um, and then she'll talk um, to more of the South African situation. And then um, hopefully we will still have time for Neva to give her insights. Um, over to you, Basani. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Um, hi, everyone. I'll try my very best to make sure I am as quick as possible. And um, thanks, Saul. Um, so I'll be speaking about the structural underpinnings of income and gender inequality in South Africa. You can go to the next slide, Saul. So income and wealth levels are largely determined by birth. If you don't have the right start in life, adequate shelter and location, good quality health care and education, and parents with well-paying jobs, then you will likely live in poverty in South Africa. Moving from poverty to middle class is like winning the lotto, because nine out of 10 South Africans' earnings are determined by what their parents earned, and a person raised by top earning parents is 70% more likely to be a top earner when entering the labor market. Households headed by black women are left to carry the burden of this severe exclusion. They are more likely to be unemployed uh, as four out of 10 households headed by women are without employment uh, compared to two out of 10 households headed by men. In addition, they are more likely to support more people because uh, more than half are, uh, uh, they support more than half um, who are extended families. Compared to a quarter of households headed by black men, a fifth of those headed by white women, and one tenth of households headed by white men. Now, the extended families are disproportionately taxing, call it the black tax, if you will, when it comes to maintenance and care work. And uh, black women headed households carry this burden while their household expenditures are seven times less than that of a, a white male headed household and four times less than the expenditures of white women-headed households. If you go to the next slide. The extent to this uh, inequality becomes clear when we look at educational attainments alone. And of course, we can look at various other factors um, where we find our educational achievements uh, affected by wage dispersals. Uh, we note how an average uh, hour wage increase 
increases sixfold from six rand per hour with a grade nine to 36 rand per hour with the junior degree. Given that three out of 10 white men in, and four out of 10 white women have attended university in South Africa, while fewer than one out of 10 black men and, uh, and women uh, have attended university, we fully appreciate that access to education is one of the defining features of racial, class, and gender inequality that prevail in, South, in the South African labor market. Next slide. Recent studies that attempt to, to decompose different factors that have contributed to worsening income inequality in South Africa have identified wage inequality as the main driver of for this in, uh, for inequality, contributing just over 90% to overall inequality. The contribution of wage income, uh, wage income inequality to overall income inequality can further be broken down to two components, uh, inequality owing to unemployment, uh, that's zero earners, and wage differentials contributing between 36 and 60%, uh, 38% and 62% respectively to income inequality. This is why studies of labor, market, of labor market become critical to understand the dynamics of income and gender inequality in South Africa. The labor market does not only determine who gets work or doesn't get work or who earns more or less income of, of, uh, in the fall, uh, and, and they, uh, yeah, and what kind of work uh, uh, will receive labor right protections. Cru crucially for a gendered analysis, the labor market also determines what kind of work is or isn't paid for, which has a bearing on employment opportunities and incomes. Uh, as can be seen from this slide, black women have less labor, mar uh, labor market, uh, 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 labor participation, are less, are less likely to get more, uh, uh, are less likely to get work and more likely to be unemployed and more likely to be discouraged job seekers. Next slide, please. So the objective of this presentation is to look at the structural underpinnings of income and gender inequality through an analysis of four segments of the labor market, that's unpaid, precarious work, uh, informal work, and, un uh, and unemployment. Next slide. So the motive force of South Africa's economy is given by a set of by a set of mining related industries and increasingly fin uh, uh, finance over the last two decades, which are termed the minerals and energy complex. This complex is more than just a range of um, mining related commodities and, ma and manufacturers that feed into each other, uh, yet are disarticulated from the rest of the manufacturing sector and in some instances the economy. Uh, importantly, the complex is rationalized through conflictual class relations between state and capital that shape uh, the gathering of wealth or, or, or capitalist accumulation. So neoliberal government policies and practices post-1994, such as trade liberalization, capital account liberalization, privatization, inflation targeting, and budget austerity has worked uh, to strengthen the MEC through deindustrialization and also through the financial, uh, a financialized e economy and contributed to underinvestment uh, in, public in, uh, uh, in, in public infrastructure and consequently reinforcing male, upper class and white privilege at the expense of um, the majority uh, and, and, and black women uh, in particular uh, who are right at the bottom and denied dignified work. Next slide, please. Privilege is expressed in the system through its highly uh, uh, dependence on a segment of labor that goes unrecognized and is undervalued, and that is care work. Care work benefits the economy because it helps people get ready for work. So without, the, uh, the, uh, so without it, it cannot, uh, the economy cannot run. And unpaid care work currently is, about, is at about 14% of GDP and women's unpaid care work burden is an obstacle for those seeking paid work. Uh, uh, and women's uh, unpaid care burden is an obstacle for those uh, seeking uh, paid work. And black women uh, contribute about 59%, uh, black men 24% uh, uh, and white women 9% nine, uh, 9 to, the, to, to the value of, 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 of care work. The magnitude of this burden, which is uh, in, in limited, which is not 
much supported by the state has implications on the labor force participation and therefore in incomes for black women in particular. Importantly, uh, the wealthiest 10% who control the economic system um, depend on this free uh, or underpaid or unrecognized uh, labor done by mostly black women and the wages they pay workers do not account for the billions of hours of unpaid care work. Next slide, please. Nonetheless, the post-apartheid dispensation has seen the feminization of work in that women labor for the women labor force uh, inc uh, has increased it increased uh, uh, extensively. However, this has taken place over a period of financialized uh, deindustrialization. And macroeconomic policy in the post-1994 period has reflected the interest of uh, South African capital to internationalize and financialize uh, and, in, and entailed the liberalization of the capital um, account, which served the dual purpose of directly facilitating the outflow of capital and portfolio inflows into the economy attracted by high interest rates and sophisticated uh, financial sector. These capital inflows ameliorate the impact of capital flight and a large and persistent current account deficit on the overall balance of payments. And following uh, global patterns, we have witnessed how non-financial corporations are more entrenched in, the, in speculative investments rather than productive long-term investments. And when there are investments made, these tend to be in MEC-related sectors, while non-MEC manufacturing um, has suffered. Both these tendencies have had an impact on employment. Next slide, please. Given the highly unequal distribution of assets, both financial and physical, in South Africa, asset price inflation has a profound effect on both wealth inequality and income inequality. And amongst the components of assets and debts, financial assets are the most unequally distributed with a Gini coefficient of 0.95. Uh, 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 and the most dramatic increase in income has been experienced by the top 10% of the population who saw an, uh, an increase of 4.2% percentage points in their share of total income between 1993 and 2008, as only the few at the very top of the wealth distribution directly hold in uh, equities and benefit from capital gains, dividends, and, 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 and payments, uh, and interest payments. Next slide, please. Employment and non-MEC um, manufacturing, um, and all these have had the tendency of, of ensuring that employment in non-MEC manufacturing uh, collapsed since the 1990s due to this to, due to deindustrialization and the decline in uh, MEC employment due to capital intensity was upended by the, uh, to, by the 2000s, by the commodity boom. Of course, the big story is the rise in services to which finance uh, and business services have, been, have seen the greatest growth, while community and social services and trade continue to, to dominate employment. Next slide, please. Whilst services have been crucial to the employment drive, we see the precarity with which they are associated as the percentage of formal employment to total employment has virtually collapsed in the, uh, the, the services sector, especially in the trade segments in community and social services. Importantly, services are, are also associated with low wage uh, work, uh, more especially in business services. Um, community and social services and the trades uh, segments. All the while, average wages in finance, manufacturing and mining uh, wages fare comparatively uh, better. Of course, all these mask the inequalities within the sectors. Could you, next one. There continues to be um, also a job reservation, uh, which is quite gendered. The manufacturing uh, sector allocates the bulk of better jobs to men, while black women work in underpaid uh, service jobs. The green boxes show the contribution of uh, employment in those in in those subs, um, in me uh, sorry. The green boxes show the contribution of male employment in those subsectors, and the pink boxes show the contribution of women employment in those subsectors. And women are more dominant. Uh, in the food and clothing and textiles, 
which are amongst the lowest paying jobs in the manufacturing sector. And women dominate the services sector, particularly the care sectors, such as education, health, and other uh, community um, services. And, and next slide, please. While government uh, greatly increased certain basic protections for labor workers, uh, for workers after the, uh, the end of apartheid, employers in uh, private and the public sector have sidestepped these regulations and pushed down wages via outsourcing, through which they displace their responsibility to provide decent pay and working conditions onto subcontractors. In just three years, the number of precarious workers had increased from one in 10 to two in 10 uh, between 2014 and 2017. And three in 10 women are elementary workers compared to uh, one in 10. And 80% of work under, uh, undertaken by labor brokered workers is, is actually typically done by permanent workers. So moreover, it is typical for precarious households to engage in uh, multi-income stream uh, strategies. We see that wages are becoming less of a dominant income source as 40% of income is derived from wages and the rest are other types of incomes and, and grants and remittances. Next slide, please. In many developing countries, a large number uh, of people working in the informal sector offsets the large, the lack of formal uh, 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 sector jobs as unemployment in South Africa, as you know, is, is a big crisis. And in South Africa, this isn't the case in part because of uh, government and corporate practices designed to keep informal workers fr uh, from, the ma from markets. A feature of the country's structure is one of deep concentration where large firms govern value chains, particularly in market segments such as food, such as the, the food sector, which it, it uh, uh, which informal trading is, is quite a significant uh, share. For those who work in the informal sector, police harassment and the stigmatization of workers as foreigners has become routine. And quite interestingly, since the global financial crisis, women are no longer dominant in the sector, nor have they found jobs in, in the formal sector, which uh, um, again is not typical of um, informal sector work in many countries. Can you go to the next slide? The, in, the NEDS data, and I forgot the whole acronym, um, income dynamics something, <laughs> uh, shows the, the volatility in the informal sector as it tracks the entrance and exit of people coming into the sector over time. Uh, perhaps what I would like to highlight is that more women at 55% than men at 44% have left not only the informal sector by wave five, um, there are different waves at, at which um, the entry and exit is calculated uh, or periods. Uh, so uh, perhaps what I, uh, to highlight is that not more, not more women at 55% than men at 44% have left not only the informal sector by have by wave five, but the labor market in its entirety too, right? Meaning they are not looking for work. And the reasons require further exploration. It could be that the wage levels are so low and there are no, no better alternatives that people find it pointless to continue. However, focus groups with women in the sector also point to the rise in, in gender-based violence as um, the sector has become increasingly unsafe. Next slide, please. And similarly, in terms of other types of opportunities for, for women, um, industrial policy incentives um, have had a bigger impact on, on, on capital intensity rather than uh, job cr uh, uh, creation uh, for those firms that, that also benefit and policies to develop industries are more skewed towards industries where the labor force is dominated by men um, and, and funding specifically for women empowered uh, businesses is limited. This means that even when good jobs are being created, they are going disproportionately uh, to men and thus reinforcing um, male privilege. Next slide, please. And also, um, 
sorry. It would be wrong to speak about this within, a, uh, uh, within the context of companies benefiting, exploiting poor policy choices from the state um, without actually looking at the racialization within firms themselves. Um, there's something to be said about the racism that is embedded into the structure that leaves black women and more especially uh, qualified uh, black uh, women behind. Um, where you have young black women between 18 and 34 years old with an, a university degree that earns 24% less than a similarly qualified white woman uh, and, white, uh, and a white man and women with no matric have better medium incomes than, than black women with matric. So um, there's something to be said, even at the level of skill um, and, 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 and how uh, uh, the racialization of that uh, affects outcomes. Next slide. Meanwhile, what we have found, what we found is that, you know, the, the wage share um, uh, has been uh, 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 falling while the, the, the profit share, all of this has happened well, the wage share has been falling and the profit share has been rising. And, um, and uh, we can also see in terms of the, the, the top 10% how their income shares have increased over time, where, uh, you know, um, uh, in 2010, I mean, these, these are not obviously to scale. It was um, uh, 15 15 times, um, they earned 15 times um, uh, the amount of the, the bottom 40. And then by, the, by 2016, this had grown by, by uh, 21 times that. Next ship, slide, please. So in conclusion, um, Income and gender inequality is not only policy choice, but also embedded in particular social norms and neoliberal macroeconomic framework has entrenched the dominance of mining related industries, much to the exclusion of job uh, creating sectors and institutionalized patriarchal social norms continue to, go to govern labor market outcomes, particularly for women. And dis uh, despite uh, the importance of the economy to the functioning of the economy, um, uh, it has, it's characterized by an uh, unpaid or, uh, or underpaid um, uh, labor force, uh, which, is, which is generally or typically undervalued. And also labor protections have had little efficacy in redressing grow, growing levels of precarity. Thank you, that's it. Thanks very much, um, Basani. I think that um, goes into a lot of excellent detail on on what Gabriel was talking about and um, unpacks something that is absolutely critical. Um, I'm now going to hand over to Neva, who's going to present her slides. Thanks, Neva. I'm going to try and do this quickly because we seem to have used up all our time. Um, I think what we've already heard, which is South Africa already, South Africa ranks high in terms of overall income inequality as well as inequality by race. And, you know, Basani's input was really, truly interesting, but compared to other countries, we're actually not as bad as by gender as some, even though these gender inequalities are severe. I do think it's important to remember that many countries don't report on inequality at all, or they misrepresent it. Um, as I always say, Angola says their Gini coefficient is 0.3, which would make them more equitable than Sweden. So I think it's important to bear in mind when we say we're the most unequal country in the world, we're the most unequal country in the world that actually reports on the data. Um, I would also argue, and I'd like to hear Basani's view on this, that there's actually not much really strong evidence that the income distribution is getting worse, although it certainly hasn't gotten a lot better either. Um, and I think the interesting thing is also that until we got to COVID-19, um, there was significant inequality. I mean, we saw a significant reduction in poverty, but not in inequality. And I think it raises two questions. One is, why should we care? And the other one is, which, what, are the, what actually leads to the reproduction of inequality 
And why is it particularly reproduced after apartheid? So I think Bassani showed very clearly that the inequality is there, but I think we really need to try and say, what are the economic systems that led to its reproduction? So when Gabriel says we should look at the primary distribution of income and not just the distribution of income after it's been affected by the state, I think we need to understand what, what is it about the South African economy that generates such an unequal primary distribution of income. And by the way, I have a paper with all the data, so I'm not doing any data. The paper's on the TIPS website under recent research. Um, and it provides all the figures behind the, the broad generalizations I am making here. Um, so why should we care just briefly? Um, one of the arguments from an economic standpoint is that extreme inequality is linked to slower growth. I would argue the main reason is actually, there are some more technical reasons, but the most important thing that we can see very clearly in South Africa is that where you have profound inequalities, investors are always concerned that um, they will be expropriated or taxed or otherwise things will change rapidly. So if you look at the ratings assessments of South Africa, they invariably say, yes, government is holding the line on, you know, on taxation and on borrowing and they're doing all the right things, but who knows how long that will last. And then socially and politically, of course, it leads to crime, but it also leads to protest actions. And it, unfortunately, and we can see that here now, I almost put a picture of clicks up. It leads to populism as well, in the sense that, you know, people can see that, you know, even if poverty has been alleviated, even if millions of people have better housing, what they can see is how far the gap is to where the really privileged are. And that leads to you know, very significant social and political tensions. And I think what you can see in South Africa in effect is that there's just a real tension between saying we have an incredibly unequal economic power system, but we have a much more equitable political system. And the political system you know, ends up having to negotiate with economic power. Um, and we can argue about how well they've done that. Um, I think it's important to be clear about the different dimensions of inequality and where I, I think I would disagree with Bassani is, I think we can't just say, you know, I would say one of the core outcomes is in terms of incomes, but we need to understand what are the inequalities that shape that outcome. So as she said, there's very deep inequalities in house, household income as a result of unequal pay scales, high joblessness, but also business earnings are very unequally distributed. So I think it's important to distinguish between wages and salaries on the one hand and business earnings on the other. Second thing though is that ownership is very unequal and by ownership, you know, you mean both the share in national profits and rents, but also the ability and power to make decisions around the economy. So basically, you know, 600 businesses pay about two thirds of company income tax, which gives you a sense of how concentrated the economy is. The top decile, in fact, the top 5% of households owns most financial assets. You only even find retirement funds in the top 20%. If you look at the land, there's about 30,000 commercial farmers and 100,000 farmers in historic labor sending regions who depend primarily on farming. So although there's about a million people, many in historic labor sending regions who, are far, who do some gardening, most of them do less than five hours a week. So basically what apartheid did was smash what in other countries would be a peasant agricultural group. And then in housing, you know, one of the things about South Africa that's fairly unique is that across all income levels, most people actually own their homes. But in fact, they don't function as economic assets, as I'm sure you all know. For one thing, most of them have very limited value under 100,000 rand. But even more important is there's no market for their home. So it's not that easy to say, I'm just going to sell a township home and buy another, much less if you live in a historic labor sending area. So you can't get a bond on it or, and you can't use it as active capital to support economic activity or to earn an income. As Bassani said, there's still extraordinarily large differences in access to quality education, depending on your household income and your race. Um, if you look at infrastructure, as we all know, it's still far worse in poor communities than in rich ones. So, I mean, I get very annoyed because radio and TV, they would talk about load shedding. They've been turning off electricity in townships around Johannesburg for months. 
in the middle of a lockdown in the middle of winter, but nobody sees that as a problem. Um, and then finally, a particular problem in South Africa because of apartheid is the historic labor sending regions where household incomes are around half as high as in the rest of the country and only about one in five people has income generating employment. So I just want to talk very briefly about the impacts of COVID. There's this thing we're talking about now called the K-shaped recovery because we've run out the rest of the alphabet. And what they mean is that COVID could in itself lead to a much even greater inequalities. Um, essentially because high income households and big business tend to be more resilient because you know, they have the resources. So we can see very clearly as tips when we do surveys of business that big businesses, they just have much more access to funds to tide them over the lockdown and the restrictions arising out of COVID than small business. Um, higher you know, managers and professionals find it easier to work from home and also just to plain isolate to keep themselves safe from getting COVID. They're able to negotiate credit and rent assistance. Both in terms of credit and rent, businesses but also high income households are able to go to formal institutions and negotiate some kind of relief during the lockdown. And then finally, the global asset bubble has meant that rich people have seen their, the value of their savings actually go up to some extent during the lockdown. How long that will last is a different question. I personally think it's a bubble. On the other hand, for working people in the poor in South Africa, you know, they've gotten a little bit of protection from the increase in social grants and the UIF, but there's nothing for the self-employed. And usually the UIF money is significantly lower than what people were earning in pay. Um, we've also seen informal evictions, but at the same time, we've banned land evasions. By informal evictions, I mean eviction, evictions have been theoretically banned during the COVID lockdown, but we, the state has not actually acted to stop people being evicted from informal housing. So when they can't pay the rent, they get evicted. But if they try and then find a land for themselves, they get, the state will keep them off that land. And then another way it's added to inequality is that schools have been closed without technology for remote learning for poor households. Rich households can usually figure something out. I think a key question, which honestly I think we need to talk about more in terms of both papers, is why has inequality reproduced so much after, um, after the transition to democracy? So those of you who were around then may remember, we kind of just thought that democracy would fix all of these things. And I would argue the problem is that we went into an historic compromise in 1994, and you can see it in the um, Reconstruction and Development Program which is, was the government would improve services for the majority and would support emerging black business, but it would not disrupt or downgrade historic centers of excellence, that is basically historically white schools, healthcare, historically white suburbs. They would have to desegregate, but they weren't going to lose their funding or in any way be forced to take in more people. Um, and it also would not do any radical changes in property rights. The Constitution said we could do expropriation in the public interest, but only through the legal process and only if we passed an appropriate law, which, by the way, we never passed, which is in itself, I think, telling. What the majority of the population got was a combination of labor rights and also increased government spending. So they got the social grants. They got vastly improved housing for many people. Also improvements in infrastructure and social services. It's easy to overlook how bad it was before because they never clearly got up to the level of sort of historically white areas or the suburbs. And rich and big business, rich households and big business agreed they would pay taxes and that they would engage on developmental aims. And that's significant that, you know, we do have quite a heavy tax burden. I mean, a high tax rate compared to other countries. And I think part of the pact, this implicit pact was that people would meet those tax needs, they would agree to a degree of redistribution as a way of keeping the peace. But I have to say we all also thought, some more of us than others, that the economy, that the economy was mostly slow because apartheid prevented any kind of integration into the global economy. And so we thought that once we're reintegrated, the economy will grow rapidly and that will make it easier to do redistribution. If we look at what actually happened, 
we didn't get to that point where we thought all of this would open economic opportunities and it, we would see a more equitable and more dynamic economy. What has happened is that black people who have qualifications have largely been able to advance through the state and to a limited extent in private business. I mean, the top end of business is still very unrepresentative, as Bassani pointed out. Um, so for instance, if you look at CEOs of listed companies, very few are black and almost none are black women. But in the state, you've seen significant advancements of black people and it's sort of middle to senior management and professions. But overall, inequality has essentially remained unchanged. We've seen pushback from taxpayers and creditors, which has made it very hard to extend government services as significantly as we had hoped, even though there have been significant improvements. I mean, I would argue that's the one place where there has been quite a lot of change, but it still hasn't brought about the, the kinds of conditions we thought it would create for greater equality. As Bassani pointed out, workplace relations have remained very little changed. They're still deeply unequal and associated with very unequal income distribution, uh, pay scales. And the economy has continued to depend essentially on mining. There's been a diversification of exports into auto, food, finance, and tourism. But these are not industries that are going to generate jobs on the necessary scale. So in contrast to Asia, you know, Asia, the classic industrialization pattern is you do clothing, then you do appliances. Those things create a lot of jobs. That creates support for industrialization, and you can sort of build a coalition for export-oriented manufacturing. Here, as Bassani pointed out, we've tended to support the big refineries and the auto industry um, and capital goods equipment. And the only thing that's in the, manu in the industrial policy that's been in the least bit labor intensive is food processing. And we actually have um, agro industry and highly in capital intensive food processing compared to many countries. So it hasn't done that much either. Um, and then finally, the inequalities in themselves put us into a bit of a vicious cycle where we're continuously fighting about policies. We can't agree on priorities. That makes it harder to drive through a policy that would actually transform the economy. So we continue with the inequalities and that in turn makes it more difficult to reach any kind of policy consensus. So, I mean, I have a list here of specific processes. We're kind of running out of time, so I'm not gonna go through them. But I think that, um, a couple of issues I, I want to talk through quickly is, for instance, to take an example, we say we need to condense the pay scales, but at the same time we say we need to maintain high pay for the professions, and where you can see that is the way we limit access to high quality education. We've never found a way to go into workplaces and say, how do you develop a modern workplace that is more consultative and that actually provides career pathing and skills across the board? And we put restrictions on skilled immigrants precisely to maintain high pay for people at the top of the scale. I mean, that's just an example, but I think it's important to say we need to consider in each of these areas of inequality, what are the specific economic, social, and political systems that lead to the reproduction of that inequality? Because that's the only way we can come up with policies that will work. And so I was gonna end up with some questions to everybody to think about. One of the things is, you know, when you're in government, we have a really hard time prioritizing. If you could do just three, think, three programs that would genuinely disrupt the reproduction of inequality, what would they be? And what are the blockages to implementing them? Why do you think, since in the abstract, you can look across the political parties, we agree about kind of what we need to do. I don't think anybody disagrees that we need more equitable workplaces, education, infrastructure, ownership, I think there's actually broad agreement on all of those things. Why is it so hard to come up with effective programs to achieve them? And then as a specific question, I'd really be interested in what people think we could do to achieve more equitable workplaces in organizational terms as the basis for getting to more equitable pay scales. And why is it so hard to do that? Thank you, Raul Boha. For the full paper, um, if you want to, um, see to read the full paper um please do so it's on the tips website and i've also put the link on the chat the group chat um we've had um excellent insights we've got a global overview we've got uh, a gendered analysis and we've got some insights into some of the transition 
um, that have happened in South Africa since 94, as well as um, a lot of data that's supporting that on, on the full paper. We can open up for a few questions. Um, I want, they've been put on the question and answer list, and I'm not going to read the questions um, because we are running out of time. But what I would like to do is ask Basani to um, try and answer some of the questions that have been put up there and to briefly explain what's being asked and then answer it. And then um, I'll hand over to Gabriel to also to do the same, to respond to some of the questions that have been posed to him on the Q&A function. Basani. Um, hi, thank you so much and thanks to, um, yeah, this has been very, um, a big learning for me as well. Uh, so thanks for having me on. Um, so what, one is from Jocelyn Vass. I think I know Jocelyn. Um, anyways, uh, if labor market income is becoming more fragile, especially for black women, how does this relate to the Boko economy that is dependent on the non-market pension grant of very, very good question. I mean, this is actually um, what is actually sustaining the youth of South Africa who are uh, the gogo economy or the, or the pensions. And, and in fact, what I, what I mentioned is to also highlight some of the, um, um, uh, the distributions in so far as how wage labor is, I mean, wage uh, income is is becoming less of a uh, of a of a thing, and how different forms of uh, um, uh, income stra uh, strategies are, are very key. Uh, the child grant and and definitely uh, the pension grant being extremely important, um, and as I say, sustaining a lot of South Africa's youth um, uh, uh, um, uh, as a result of of really high youth unemployment as, uh, uh, as well. Um, and in, in fact, um, many households are um, headed by uh, the, the, the 60, the, the, you know, the, pen the pensioners, especially given the impact of, of, of HIV and AIDS uh, in, 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 in our society. Um, I think that expanded that level of dependence as well. Um, uh, from Neva, what do you think leads to the reproduction of inequality in South Africa, i.e. what leads to women being in services instead of manufacturing? Well, I, uh, I do think that, um, and I mean, I, I, I wasn't great at like highlighting all these um, issues, um, but uh, for me, okay, there is a particular structure of the, first of all, I do think uh, social norms are very um, important. What you tend to find is that women, right, um, who are, whose role, right, patriarchal role is that of the carer. What you find is that what is, what happens within the household is replicated uh, in spaces, in, in, in the economy, in terms of the roles that they end up taking. So uh, we know that in apartheid, they were not the ones in, in the mines, when when there were when uh, certain labor restrictions happened, many of them were typically, of course, in domestic work, but typically in in the retail sector, right? Um, and I'm talking uh, women in general and black women in in particular. So, what you find is that they how they are defined as carers is then replicated in various other spaces. So, if you find a woman in the manufacturing sector, you will tend to find that um, that woman is perhaps a cleaner, is um, perhaps um, um, you know in the canteens or, 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 or things like that, uh, rather than in um, uh, yeah. And so where you find women in the manufacturing sector, as I pointed out, it's 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 all the it's like the nimble fingers. Um, uh, thing, a characterization where you'll find them in clothing and textiles. So much of it has to do with um, how the household in shaping um, and society in shaping the role of women as carers then kind of like um, uh, exposes itself within the market economy. Thanks. Thanks very much, Basani. Um, Gabrielle, I don't know if you can see the Q&A. And if you want to um, talk to some of the questions that have been asked to you there. Thanks, yes, Gabriel. Yes, um, but 
you will forgive me, I will basically mention a couple of points of what Bessani and Neva said, which is, I take it as question. The first point is that I, all, I completely agree with Bessani when she said that in South Africa and in Latin America, the same, that income is determined at birth. But remember, today, the same is happening in Europe and the US. This reverse catching up of Europe and the US is such that if you look at the so-called Gatsby curve, you know that the one that relates inequality with social mobility, US today has the same number than Latin America. And Europe is almost there, meaning the massive deterioration of market inequality has much more impact on social mobility than uh, inequality after taxes and transference. And the reverse catching up of Europe and the US is means that the gas curve, the relationship with basically social mobility is disappearing in Europe and the US. They are the reverse catching up also gets on, on social mobility. So although you are quite right in what you says, if you were discussing Europe and the US, you will see that that phenomenon is also happening here more and more. The US has already got to Latin American levels. And just one number, in the, the top 1% in the US spends more than $2 million per child in their education. From nursery to university, the top 1% in the US spend more than $2 million per child, per child on their education. So hardly surprising, they get to the top university, they get the top jobs and the whole social mobility completely disappeared. So it's, it's amazing how the reverse catching up is more associated with market inequality than with disposable income inequality. Big subject I just want to mention. Uh, on Neva, she started by saying that South Africa is not the worst country in the world in inequality. Okay, fine, it doesn't matter. I mean, whether it's the worst or not is bad enough. If very quickly I share my, my, my screen, Look at the inequality market, and this, I didn't have time to get to this graph. Look at South Africa. A is the beginning of democracy. The market inequality in South Africa has actually slightly deteriorated since the beginning of democracy. And the disposable income has also slightly deteriorated since the beginning of democracy. And second, the distributed effort Remember, Europe does 50% in terms of improving the, the market gene to this possible, it's just 13%, okay? So, the, I mean, things are, are, are bad enough and one has to start from there. That maybe other countries are worse, I'm sure you're absolutely right. Now, on the second point of NEVA about inequality and poverty, yes, I mean, in, in Chile, when we returned to democracy in 1990, 40%, 40% of the population was below poverty line. Ten years later, that, that number has fallen by half, from 40% to 20%. But inequality has not changed a single digit. The Gini and the Palma ratio were exactly the same after that. Why? Because it's very cheap to improve a poverty. In South Africa, if you were to, as I said, the bottom 40% gets 7% of the national income. If you improve it, say, to 10, you could cut your poverty rate by half. But that had hardly had an impact on equality, that the bottom 40% makes 7% of national income on, or 10, it will hardly affect the Gini or the Palma ratio. However, the, you can cut uh, poverty by half. Fiona Tregena, great economist in South Africa, she has a fantastic paper of this, how cheap it would be in South Africa to reduce poverty. So although reducing poverty is absolutely essential, let's forget the impact that that, that may have on its own on inequality. And, um, on the, and on the question made very briefly on the question made by some of the people in the audience, the, the crucial one is about, uh, I mean, there are too many to, to go there, so you will forgive me. I don't know, uh, Saul didn't tell me how long do I have, but given the time, probably I don't have a lot of time. But the key point, I think, in several of the questions, which are many, uh, is about this issue about inequality and economic efficiency. I mean, my crucial point, I show it in Germany and in the rest of the, the paper is very clearly, is that the only way 
the only way that you can get a market inequality, market inequality of a genie worse than say 30, the only way in a market economy is by distorting market. It's by big agents distorting market in their favor. A market economy, if it was a capitalist market economy, where there would be competition and compulsions, I mean, it's, if it was market economy, the one that Keynes was talking about, Germany and the US in, at the end of the 19th century, or the one that Marx had in mind, if it was a capitalist market economy, it will be highly unequal, but that highly unequal will be a genie market genie probably not worse than 30. So anything about that, anything that it goes up to the, to the high 30, 40, let alone Germany and Europe now in the 50s like that in America, you can only get there at the cost of efficiency, market efficiency. You can only get there in, in, in the sense of creating artificial rents like artificial um, oligopolistic con concentration, remember the number I gave. In the last 10 years, the advanced countries have spent $40 trillion, $40 trillion in merging and acquisition. Does anybody think that that process is something in order it will generate efficiency? It's basically you are getting rid of the competition. Instead of competing, particularly when effective demand is growing so slowly, the only way to increase market shares is by, uh, by acquiring your, 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 your competition. So the $40 trillion of merging acquisition has basically been a process to decrease competition. So capitalists with, without competition, it is one of the most inefficient economic systems has ever invented, okay? So the key problem that goes in several of the questions that uh, were asked is that, but is just to repeat, the only way to have high inequality in the market in a capitalist economy is by distorting market, by not letting competition work, by capturing policy, by transforming state in these completely emasculated state uh, entities that you find all over the world, that they are completely in the pocket of big business, in pocket in two sense, I mean the real pocket, but also ideologically in their pocket, by in the case of the European social democracy, by abandoning their economic agenda the sort of progressive economic agenda, the Keynesian Roosevelt economic agenda of the post-war, in which the economic agenda already created a low level of market inequality. Therefore, the distributed effort was not as anywhere near as big as it is now. In fact, it was less than half what it is now. So that the low level of a disposable income inequality was generated already almost entirely in the market so that uh, that economy at least can develop the productive forces, okay? That economy at least can get us somewhere and one can improve that with in the margins through taxes and transfer. It may not be my ideal, it may not be most of the ideal of people listening to this presentation, but at least would is better than the worst of both worlds, what we have today, which is capitalism, one that is highly inefficient. And the key reason why it is highly inefficient is because the only way to get to market inequality of roughly 50 in the Gini is by big agent distorting markets in their favor, creating artificial rents, appropriating those artificial rent, completely capturing policy and all the rest. So the relationship as was clear in Germany, if you get to a Gini 50 in market inequality, in investment will collapse, productivity growth will collapse and, and all the rest. And of course, emerging Asia cannot believe their luck because this completely now uh, is a fairly stagnant economy falling behind, it opened massive productive opportunities for Asia, emerging Asia, which are, they're very able to, to, to take on. So I think Saul is looking like my time is over. So I'm sorry about, uh, uh, I mean, you got, it's easy to find my email. If any other the people who ask questions, who feels that I, I didn't have time enough to answer their question, I'll be very happy to do it personally through an email. Thanks, Saul. Thank you very much, Gabriel. Um, I see there are two hands, one from Mungeni and one from Francis. 
um, sorry, Francois, um, we, we're not going to have time to take the additional questions. I just want to do closing comments from Neva, and then we'll wrap up the session. Um, Mungeni, Francois, you're welcome to email your questions. As Gabriel said, um, you can find his email address, otherwise I have it. And otherwise, if it's for Neva or Basani, um, please um, contact me. Um, or the tips address, and you'll be able to get hold of them um, if it's questions for them. Um, Never your concluding remarks, and then we'll wrap up. And I think that, um, you know, I got a question saying, how would I answer that last question? I think, you know, really, at its, as it were, objective level, the critical things we need to fix to me are the inequality in the workplaces, the production structure, um, deep inequalities in education. Um, and I think that the real problem with all of those things are two things. Firstly, to build a sufficient coalition for change that we can actually drive disruptive change. And we've not been able to do that yet. I do think that given the impact of the pandemic, a critical issue is going to be how do we mobilize additional resources for both to, to enable And incomes. Um, and I think that we need to seriously look at issues that I think Gabrielle raised around things like taxes, but also solidarity bonds with a low rate of interest. And some of those things that countries do when they're in a crisis and solidarity is important. And I would like to, I think we need to talk about given the horrifying GDP figures, you know, how do we think about that? How do we ensure that the burden is not just borne by the poor? Because in such a deeply unequal society, it is neither socially nor politically sustainable or economically sustainable. I do want to say, just to say very briefly, you know, I wasn't trying to attack Gabriel's figures. I was just saying, in terms of our discourse in South Africa, this thing of always saying everything is getting worse is both inaccurate and demoralizing. So if we're serious about building a coalition for change, I think we also have to say, where have we made progress? How do we build on that? Rather than always thinking that the only way to get progress is to scare rich people into it by saying how terrible things are. People know how bad things are. But they do keep voting for the ANC. And if you ask them why, they'll tell you, because of social grants and because of housing. You know, and I think we shouldn't overlook those gains and how important they are to people. The question is, how do we strengthen them in a way that deals with the inequalities in the society, rather than just, than just giving a few crumbs to the people at the bottom of the pile, while the people at the top continue to get the rents? Thanks. I think on um, th those very um, wise words, I think we, we should end the session. Um, thank you to all three panelists. Um, unfortunately, Basani's had to leave for another commitment. And thank you to all the participants, uh, many of whom have stayed until um, the end. And I'm now going to close the session. Um, you're welcome to find all the papers on the TIPS website. And thank you to the supporters of Accord, um, the RDC, and the Department of Trade, Industry, and Competition um, for your contribution to making Accord happening. Thanks very much, everyone, and have a good evening. Bye. Thank you.